Welcome back to Counting to Five, a podcast about the United States Supreme Court. In this episode, I'm going to talk about the court's decision in District of Columbia v. Wesby, which was issued on Monday, January 22nd, 2018. Uh, now, this case, it was uh, almost unanimous. It was nine to zero siding for uh, the District of Columbia um, with a majority opinion by Justice Thomas, but two of the justices, Justice uh, Sotomayor and Justice Ginsburg, had some disagreements with the majority, which I'll discuss in a bit. Um, so what this case is about, it was uh, what was described uh, by the court as a raucous late night party in D.C. Now, police responded to noise complaints and complaints of illegal activity from uh, neighbors. And what they found was a house that was in dis disarray. It looked largely vacant. The only downstairs furniture were some folding chairs. And when the police got there, they found what the opinion described as a makeshift strip club uh, drinking, the smell of marijuana. Upstairs, they found a group of partiers naked on a bare mattress, which was the only bed in the house. And some of the partygoers scattered and hid when they saw the police. The police found and questioned 21 partygoers and got inconsistent stories from them. Uh, a number of them said that they were there for a bachelor party, but no one could identify who the bachelor was. And some of the partygoers said they were invited by someone, a woman uh, known only as Peaches or Tasty. Uh, and this Peaches was supposedly a new tenant, um, but she was not there when the police arrived. However, uh, police were able to talk to Peaches on uh, the phone of one of the partygoers. Um, Peaches told the police that she had left the party to go to the store, but refused to come back because she didn't want to be arrested. She initially claimed to the police that she was renting the property and had given permission for the party. But later, she admitted to the police that she had no permission to be there. The police then called the owner of the house um, and the owner uh, said that he was, in fact, they had been negotiating a lease with Peaches, but they had reached no agreement and she had no permission to be there. At that point, the 21 party goers were all arrested for unlawful entry uh, and they were eventually charged with disorderly conduct, but all those charges were later dropped. So why is this case uh, here? Why is it up the Supreme Court? Well, 16 of those 21 party goers later sued the District of Columbia and five police who were at the scene for false arrest. Now, there are two issues at play here in the case. The first is, did the police have probable cause to arrest? And that's uh, probable cause is required by the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution. Um, and the second question is, even if the police did not have probable cause, were they nevertheless protected by qualified immunity? Now, qualified immunity is a, a rule that, that protects police and other public officials from liability for violating someone's rights unless the violation they unless they were in violation of clearly established law. So the district court um, ruled on both of these two questions. First, on probable cause, they said that the police had no probable cause to arrest the party goers. Now, the reason is that unlawful entry requires that a person knew or should have known that they were unauthorized. Um, and the party goers had claimed that they were invited by this person named Peaches. Um, the police spoke to Peaches who claimed, who, who said that she had invited the party goers. And the police had no evidence that, they, that the party goers knew or should have known that Peaches actually had no permission to be there. So the district court says uh, the, the police had, uh, had no evidence of this required um, knowledge uh, on the part of the party goers, so there's no probable cause. Um, the court went on to discuss qualified immunity and said, because this standard for unlawful entry was clearly established, the fact that the party goers had to know or, or should have known um, that they weren't authorized to be there, because that was clearly established, then um, the officers had violated clearly established law. The party goers were awarded $680,000 in damages. And then when you add in attorney's fees, it came to almost a million dollars. And this was appealed up to the uh, Court of Appeals for the DC Circuit, which um, affirmed the district court on both probable cause and qualified immunity. So upheld that damage award um, uh, for uh, against the, uh, the city and the police. So that brings us to the Supreme Court. Um, now, Justice Thomas who wrote the uh, majority opinion. He really digs into the facts um, about what the police found when they arrived on the scene. And he says basically that the officers could make a reasonable inference from what they saw that the party goers knew the house was vacant. First of all, 
There was the only furniture in the house were some folding chairs and one bare mattress. There were no boxes or moving supplies. There were no clothes in the closet, nothing that suggested someone was in the process of moving into the home. More, moreover, Thomas says that the, the conduct of the party goers didn't suggest that they, they believed they were in someone's home. The floor was filthy. It was littered with beer bottles and cups. There was a strip club going on downstairs and some sort of sex party upstairs. Basically, Thomas describes it as not the way a guest would be expected to treat a host's actual home. Uh, then there was the fact that some of the party goers fleed and hid from the police and people that people gave these vague and implausible answers to the police's questioning. Uh, for example, that, that it was a bachelor party, but uh, without a bachelor, apparently, and that um, most of the party goers didn't even know Peach's name, except for uh, some of the strippers who were apparently working at the party. And finally, the, the Peach's answers, the answers she gave to the police on the phone were, were evasive and her story changed and that justified the police in disbelieving what she told them about having, you know, uh, having invited the party goers and told them that she, uh, that she lived there. So uh, what this came down to for Justice Thomas was that for a probable cause determination, you need to look at the totality of the circumstances. The lower court viewed these various facts, each one in isolation. And uh, the Thomas opinion says, Here's a quote. The panel majority identified innocent explanations for most of these circumstances in isolation. But again, this kind of divide and conquer approach is improper. And then he goes on to say, a factor viewed in isolation is often more readily susceptible to an innocent explanation than one viewed as part of a to totality. And here, the totality of the circumstances gave the officers plenty of reasons to doubt the party goers' protestations of innocence. So, so that resolves the issue of probable cause. Now that could have ended the opinion right there because once uh, once um, the court has decided that the police officers have no probable cause, then there can be no liability. But Thomas decides to go on and look at the qualified immunity question also. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later, about that decision to go on later. Um, but the, the um Thomas points out that under the qualified immunity rules to be to find that there was clearly established law is a, a high standard. It requires that the precedents have to be clear enough that that every reasonable official would interpret it to um, to uh, to establish a, a, the rule uh, in question. And it also has to apply to the particular circumstances with a pretty high degree of specificity. You can't cite a um, vague high level of generality uh, rule if it's not clear how that would apply in any particular, in the, in the particular facts that are at, that are at issue. Um, so, uh, so with that in mind, um, Th Thomas uh, says that, that uh, he looks at a few things. He says basically that the, the, the party goers here, the plaintiffs were un unable to show um, any precedent that uh, found an unlawful arrest in very similar circumstances. But on the other hand, there are precedents that the police can infer um, someone's knowledge of wrongdoing from their actions, and also precedents saying that uh, the police are allowed to disbelieve someone's innocent explanations if they have uh, reason to disbelieve that. And um, given those precedents, uh, supporting the police officers' uh, inferences and, and disbelieving the innocent explanation and no contrary precedents showing that this was unlawful, there is definitely no clearly established law here. Um, one thing that's interesting about this opinion, um, given that it's written by Justice Thomas, is just last year in uh, June 2017, in a case called Ziegler v. Abbasi, now this was a case about alleged mistreatment of uh, Muslim and Arab prisoners after September 11th. Um, in this case, uh, Justice Thomas wrote a concurrence and he expressed what he called his growing concern with the court's qualified immunity jurisprudence. He suggested it had become uh, disconnected from its historical foundations and that the court was basically providing immunity much more broadly than was justified by, uh, by the origins of the qualified immunity doctrine. And he said in that, in that uh, concurring opinion, he said, in an appropriate case, we should reconsider our qualified immunity jurisprudence. Um, but here in this case, um, there's no indication of any uh, hesitation to apply the qualified immunity doctrine. Um, he just goes ahead and applies the standard qualified immunity doctrine. 
Um, maybe this is because there are no other justices that are interested in revisiting this topic and he's just all by himself there. Or maybe Justice Thomas thought this was the wrong case um, and he's still looking for a, a better opportunity, a case with facts that are um, uh, more uh, conducive to a, a good opinion on, on the, the scope of qualified immunity. So that's something to, to look for going forward. So that brings me to the two justices who did not um, join Justice Thomas's uh, opinion. Uh, first, we've got Justice Sotomayor. Now, she had an opinion concurring in part, and she agrees with the majority's opinion on qualified immunity. Um, but she argues, uh, this is a short opinion, she argues that the court should not have reached the probable cause question at all. Um, she says, uh, so basically, courts often have a situation where there are multiple issues that could potentially be dispositive, multiple issues that could, could take care of the case. Um, in this case, um, if the police and the District of Columbia win on either the probable cause or the qualified immunity, in either case, there's no liability and that could resolve the case. Um, normally, when courts have multiple issues that could be dispositive, they, they often have a choice of which one to resolve, of, of how to approach uh, this decision. Um, but in this area, there, there's, there's a few cases. I'm going to uh, kind of take a quick detour through a few other cases. Um, there was a case in 2001 called Saucier v. Katz, and in that opinion, the Supreme Court said in this particular circumstance where you're talking about um, an allegation of a, of a constitutional violation and qualified immunity, uh, when, when you have those issues, that the court said that courts should consider that in a two-step sequence. First, the court should look at whether a constitutional right was actually violated and see if that resolves the, the case. And then only if they do find that there was a constitutional right violated, go on to determine whether uh, it was um, whether it was in violation of clearly established law. So that's the qualified immunity question. And the reason for this, uh, part of the reason for this is that it ensures that the constitutional law, the important questions of constitutional law will continue to be developed by these cases. Because if you had courts routinely just deciding on qualified immunity grounds that there isn't clearly established law, but not going on to decide the actual constitutional question, then you, you could have a situation where areas of the law just, just never um, become uh, clarified and, re and resolved. And uh, you could have situations where um, uh, police or other public officials continue to violate people's constitutional rights um, or, or the, they continue to engage in conduct, not because courts have found that it's, that it's okay, but that courts have never found that it's uh, violating clearly established law and, and these constitutional violations would, would uh, not be cleared up. So the court said um, that when a court addresses this type of situation, they should do this two-step process. However, in a later decision in 2009, a case called Pearson v. Callahan, the court basically overruled the mandatory two-step order from uh, Saucier v. Katz. And they said basically in, in very fact-intensive cases, um, it's a waste of judicial resources to 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 really dig in to the individual facts. Uh, as you saw in this case, um, de deciding whether there's probable cause really uh, may require you to get down into the details of exactly what the police saw, what were all the facts on the ground, and 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 looking at the you know the totality of the circumstances. And uh, so the court said, in some of these fact-heavy cases, um, it's a waste of judicial resources. And what's more developing the law in those type of fact intensive cases is not very helpful to later cases because the facts are already going to be different. So always going to be different. So it doesn't, um, it doesn't do that much, uh, to, uh, to clarify, uh, things for later cases. So, um, in that case, they basically said, you know, when you're in one of these qualified immunity situations, it's up to the discretion of the judge. If you can, uh, easily dispose of the of the case on qualified immunity grounds by saying it wasn't clearly established law, then you can avoid going into the um, get digging into the details on the constitutional violation. But courts, uh, you know, were still allowed to and, and even encouraged to follow the Saucier v. Katz two step order in cases where it wasn't an enormous burden and they could clear clear up the law. So. Um, um, Sotomayor is basically arguing that, that this was a case, one of these fact intensive cases where, um, the qualified immunity question is easier to answer and clearer. And the fact intensive, uh, bit should have been, uh, the court shouldn't have dug into that. 
Um, interestingly, there's a, another opinion that Justice Thomas cites in his um, his uh, opinion, his majority, which is kind of the flip side. It was a 2011 case called Ashcroft v. Al Kidd, and that was kind of a reverse situation. The Supreme Court there said, when the court finds that, when the Supreme Court finds that there's no constitutional violation, it has the discretion to go on from there and still decide the qualified immunity question anyway. So this is the flip side where where um, if one situation would would resolve the uh, the case, and that was the, the Saucy v. Katz and Pearson v. Callahan were about if qualified immunity could easily resolve the case, do you need to decide probable cause anyway, or can you decide probable cause anyway, should you? This is the other way around. If you can resolve the case on the constitutional grounds first, um, do you still decide qualified immunity? The Supreme Court said you can. Uh, the court has discretion to do that. And Again, it allows for the law of qualified immunity to be developed in these cases, um, but it also, in the case of an appellate court, it, it prevents mistakes um, by an, a lower court on qualified immunity from from evading review, from being insulated from review and not and not getting corrected. Um, so Thomas cited that as a reason to uh, to go on in this case and and, and uh, answer both uh, qualified immunity and um, and the underlying constitutional issue. Um, so, uh, that's, uh, that's Justice Sotomayor's opinion. Then the last, uh, opinion in the case was, um, uh, by Justice Ginsburg. Um, and she, um, she took a, a, a different approach and, and revisited the facts and kind of pointed out some, some facts about the arrest that, uh, weren't in the, uh, majority's recounting. And, um, what she said basically was that the, uh, the arrest was actually um, uh, instigated uh, by a, a, a sergeant who was uh, who was supervising the officers on the scene, um, who believed that the, once they found out that the actual owner of the house hadn't consented to have the, to allow the people to be there, that that alone was enough to justify an arrest. Um, in other words, he didn't he didn't believe that it mattered whether the party goers knew or should have known that they weren't allowed to be there. And uh, as a matter of law, uh, this sergeant was was incorrect. Um, their knowledge was relevant. Now, the, the majority's decision is all focused on whether the police had grounds to um, to to believe that the the party goers knew or should have known. Um, but in fact, uh, the actual arrest, um, the the police didn't even believe they had to had to had to make that inquiry and and decide that. Um, then there's also the fact that uh, when they were brought to the station, the uh, the party goers were booked for disorderly conduct, not actually for the unlawful entry. Um, but no officers actually testified to any seeing any disorderly conduct. And the sergeant, the same one who who said that they should be arrested, said that the disorderly conduct charges were unwarranted and wouldn't hold up. Um, so the question that Justice Ginsburg is raising here is whether the court should continue its practice uh, um, of ignoring the actual state of mind of the uh, officials whose actions are being challenged. Um, and what she she's doing is she's calling for the reconsideration of a 1996 case called Ren v. United States. And that's a case where the, the court um, established that the subjective state of mind of, uh, for example, an arresting officer is irrelevant as long as actual probable cause exists. So uh, for an example, this is an example that's, that's a, a frequently recurring pattern in, in court cases. Uh, suppose that the police see someone driving a car who they regard as a, a suspicious character. There's someone who they have suspicions about maybe being involved in drugs or something like that, but they have no probable cause to actually uh, pull that person over or arrest them. Um, the police can follow that person, watch for some sort of traffic violation, and then pull them over for that traffic violation. And... Uh, that um, that stop and, and detention is is can be perfectly legitimate, even if the motivate if as long as they had actual probable cause, meaning they actually saw a real traffic violation, then even if they were motivated by um, other factors that had nothing to do or that were not enough to amount to probable cause, the tra the uh, the detention can still be uh, justified. Um, and this is uh, that scenario, something very much like that appears to be. Um, appears to be uh, the case in, in a case 
just earlier this term that was argued at the Supreme Court called Bird v. United States. And that's a case, if, if you've listened to uh, um, some of my earlier episodes, you may have uh, heard me discuss it, but that's a case about a, a rental car. And the question is, what protection, if any, does the Fourth Amendment provide to the driver of a rental car if the driver is not an authorized driver under the rental car agreement? Um, but the, the facts of that case describe the police seeing someone they describe as suspicious, following him on the highway and watch it, waiting for him to commit a very minor traffic infraction, the kind of thing that would normally just be uh, completely ignored, and then pulling him over. And then that eventually leads to a search of the car and uh, the discovery of drugs. So, so it's, it's the very, you know, it's an example of this, this type of fact pattern where the police's actual intentions and their state of mind is not what's relevant to the legal analysis. It's just whether they actually had this objective um, uh, probable cause. So this Wren case, um, the 1996 case, that's been heavily criticized as um, basically encouraging racial profiling by the police, basically allowing racial profiling, because as long as the police can point to some facts that would provide probable cause, then there's no, um, no inquiry into what they were actually thinking, you know, whether there were actually some uh, wrongful or discriminatory motives uh, in the police's mind, um, it doesn't matter as long as uh, as long as they had some uh, actual probable cause. So uh, that's that's what Ginsburg is, uh, is suggesting should be should be reconsidered by the court. But in this particular case, she agrees that given the current state of the law, um, there is qualified immunity, and so she. Uh, sides with the the majority in finding that there's no liability can be no liability for the police so it'll be interesting to see going forward whether this is a a uh, recurring uh, issue that justice ginsburg um, raises in the future and also whether any other justices have any interest in re-examining that line of cases so that's it for this episode uh please subscribe to counting to five on youtube or your audio podcast app of choice and for timely coverage of the latest developments of the court, please check out County to Five's weekly YouTube live streams, where you can ask your own questions in the live chat. We're currently broadcasting Thursday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern time, but check the County to Five YouTube channel for the next scheduled live stream. And I'm always looking for feedback. I would love to hear from you about what you think about the podcast. Please leave a comment or send me an email at mike at countingtofive.com. And thank you for listening. This has been Counting to Five.